Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's the month of June, and yet we still have some people that are able to find the time and energy to join us. Uh, my name is Eva Degostini. I'm a psychologist and and the coordinator of the Center of Excellence for Behavior Management, which is a support to our 10 English school boards of Quebec. And it's my pleasure to be here uh, with my colleague, Catherine Cora, if you want to just say a few words to introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. So I am a behavior consultant, and I'm also co-coordinator of the Center of Excellence with Eva, and uh, looking forward to this presentation with you. Great. So our topic today is a play and emotion. Um, we a few weeks ago we present I presented on the neuroscience of emotion, um, and which was mainly about play the role that it plays not not the neuroscience of emotion sorry the neuroscience of play because our focus is on play um, and how it uh, enhances the brain development so the the more cognitive part of the brain that we of course uh, want to access uh, in our education system but we realized that it was important also to share with you the other big role that uh, that play has um, and that is in its role together with um, uh, with oops, hang on, there we go uh, for emotion and uh, so we're going to unpack that a little bit today um, because it's very important that we understand not only for our little ones, um, our K4s, K5s, obviously, but all of our students all the way through mm -hmm. well into high school and even for ourselves as adults, um, that play has a very special role, an important role in helping us to develop uh, on the emotional side. Of course, um, we're basing this through the work of Dr. Gordon Neufeld, the Devel Neufeld developmental paradigm. And we're always looking at what well, what happens in terms of the maturation? Um, when we talk about uh, about emotion, uh, we're talking about vulnerability and how that works into it. Um, and of course, the importance of having a, uh, a st strong relationship so that we feel safe. But today our focus is going to be on the world of emotions, uh, which are of course very, very important to us. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what they are. Uh, they are basically something very important to us. They're wired in, into us, they are. Um, they have work to do. We have uh, in psychology, unfortunately, um, have for probably about thirty or forty years. There have been a whole sort of uh, areas of psychology that completely ignored emotions. I know that I was trained in that time, and it was an interesting time because we had people like Carl Rogers who talked about the human side of development, and then we had our behaviorists, and it got very confusing. But now that we're able to look inside of the brain, we know that emotions are something that are wired into us, and we are also recognizing that emotion has work to do. Ultimately, emotion, the job of emotion is to grow the child up. And it's interesting because we don't often think of the, the energy, the force within us that moves us to grow and develop, which Dr. Neufeld calls emergence, uh, and which many of you recognize in the wonderful children that you teach that desire to, to do things themselves, to try out new things. Um, you know, these are the children, who, this energy, this emergence uh, manifests itself when a child goes further than what you've taught them to do. You know, a child who says, look, I wrote a sentence, you know, and, and they went further than, you know, whatever it was that you had asked them to do. So that desire to do more. Um, and we don't often think of it as an emotion, but if we think of emotions as something that move us, okay, and 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 got, cause us to, to kind of go further, to do things, to, to engage in our world, um, it can be also seen as an emotion. But of course, emotions have the other job, which is survival. Um, how do we survive in a world that isn't always meeting our needs? Uh, and again, uh, today's work, we're not going to be spending a lot of time on emotion, just a little bit of it, but it actually is something that, that we have to understand. So when we look at emotion, we're talking about being stirred up, right? Being moved to do something that happens to us, and it's not necessarily under our control. It's, it's so fascinating uh, because we think, but often even just the desire to go further, the desire to take a risk kind of takes us over. Uh, again, when I think about emergence, uh, I remember my daughter and I often would laugh with each other because we would say things like, oh, mom, please don't say that you're bored because I know you're going to have another new idea of something else you want to do. And that's exactly it. The desire to do more comes when 
everything's at rest and you have a space to grow, but it comes from within. You know, you, you manifest and you just explain how it's supposed to go, but, but or, you know, how what you want to do specifically to you, but the desire to do that actually comes from inside. Um, sometimes, of course, it can be manifest in a way that's irrational, even though the brain has its reasons. And uh, again, if you're interested in this, how this all plays out, listen to many of our uh, sessions that we did on alarm, on frustration, on counter will, um, because all of those are come from the, an emotional base. And the brain is moved to do something to make sense of an emotion, and especially of a world that is not working. Um, and it is meant to move us in a way that will serve us, that will make sense for us. So where does it come from? Well, it comes from the limbic system, which is deep inside of our brain. And I, I everybody knows about this right now. Um, I, when I did this many, many years ago, it was like brand new information. It isn't, but we need to constantly remind ourselves that it comes from a part of our brain that is deeply wired inside of us, that very rarely gets, um, uh, it, it, like the, that part of the brain is highly functional because it's well protected inside of the brain. Uh, and basically we have our amygdala, which registers any kind of a threat it's like our smoke detector so if there's something going on outside it's basically saying you got to do something connects with the hypothalamus which basically is the the part of the brain that activates the sympathetic nervous system and gets us to do something and of course they're connected with the hippocampus where memory is housed and uh, both short-term memory um, memory for what it is that uh, that threatens us but also taking things from short-term memory into long-term memory. So actually dealing with our emotions is incredibly important when we are when we are trying to get children to remember things, because when we are able to deal with the day-to-day -day emotions that potentially uh, threaten our survival, then our hippocampus can do the job of putting things deeply into our cortex so that then we can use that information for other aspects of our learning. So the sympathetic nervous system gets activated. We get cortisol, adrenaline, norepinephrine, and growth hormone into our system. And, it's, and that causes things like blood vessel constriction, increase in heart rate, the blood diverting to the muscles, and of course, perhaps even problems with, with rest and digest. But it is kind of a force that needs to move through us. Once the system is activated, it's got to find a way out. Um, and of course, again, we're in 2022, we are, you know, at, we are hoping the tail end of the pandemic. Uh, just yesterday, I was thinking, oh, you know, I don't feel quite so anxious anymore, quite so kind of stirred up <laughs> when I have to go shopping now, you know, and it's because I've gotten used to all the things I have to do around shopping, even though many of the, the you know, the masks and so on, we don't have to do anymore. But, but that that movement has to go through us and I'm finally you know I think my brain is kind of getting used to it so there's less movement and so I don't feel it as much but what we so therefore what we need to understand about emotions is that they need to be expressed to preserve healthy functioning uh, and well-being and they're supposed to rise and flow through our children and the existence of emotions is not a problem maybe how they're expressed. And again, listen to some of our other uh, presentations where uh, we've helped you to deal with some of the expressions that are maybe not quite so acceptable and can cause problems in our classrooms and in our schools. Um, but what we're going to focus on today is, is, is the other way in which emotions can be expressed. So just to continue with emotions, they do need to be expressed, but as you know, they're messy, chaotic, unacceptable, and they can be alienating and wounding. And some of our children um, can be very sensitive to the fact that this expression can actually threaten their relationships. And interestingly enough, some of our kids, that doesn't really seem to make much of a difference. It all comes out. For some of our other children, they hold on to them and they bring them inside of them. And it actually, because they, they recognize, and I again, I think of my daughter and my son, both of whom are sensitive, wonderful, lovely people, but my son was much more sensitive to that. And he held a lot of stuff inside of himself because he didn't want to upset his parents. We call this sense of where we can express emotions. Dr. Neufeld calls that the parameters of attachment. So when we worry about, when we're, when we're told what it is that's acceptable within our families, it's like a cookie cutter. And every family has its little cookie cutters of what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Some cultures have them as well. But what we need to remember is that as, as emotional beings, we are off, we are 
much larger than that cookie cutter. In fact, this cookie cutter could even be bigger. It could fill the whole page because every emotion that we experience is important. So what we are aiming for here is the human emotional health and maturity. And again, Dr. Neufeld has sort of been able to uncover the steps towards that. And we're going to talk about one part of that. But basically, the steps are uh, uh, expressing emotion, then being able to name it, and then finally being able to feel it. And again, we need to remember there's an awful lot going on underneath the iceberg. We have the emotions of frustration. We have alarm. Uh, they especially um, it cause adrenaline and cortisol to be activated in our system. We also have sadness. Um, these are emotions. These are within our body, within our limbic system. They exist. And then it's a question of can we feel them? Can we acknowledge them? Okay, because when we bring them to a consciousness, now we're starting to acknowledge them. And we have to be careful because sometimes we, we uh, assume that children are able to feel their feelings and not all children can. And again, the topic for some of our other sessions. But the reality is that when they do express them, we have to also be careful not to get too worried about it. Because when a child can say, for example, with frustration, this isn't working for me, this is dumb, I hate this, something has to change, they are basically naming the emotion of frustration. Or when children say, I'm scared. That is actually a child who's saying, and I had this experience um, with, with a relative, uh, a young man uh, on the autism spectrum who had to attend his grandfather's funeral. And, and when he was at the funeral, he loves his grandmother and he has a very good relationship with her. He says, you know, grandma, I'm really scared of being here. I'm really scared, he said. And she got a little bit upset. And I, I had a chance a bit later to say to her, this, he is telling you what's going on in terms of his emotions. As a result of that, he can also access the other emotion, which he had to draw on to be able to get himself to the, to the funeral, which was desire to be there. I said, don't worry about the fact that he said he's scared. That's a very healthy sign that he is now feeling the emotions that are within him, and that will help propel him further. And of course, tears, which are basically a sign of sadness. So a child who says they're sad, it's very, very important because emotions are, are not always felt, but they still exist. So when we are looking at our emotional development, children need to be able to feel, name and feel their emotions and then they can mix them. The this this, this uh, relative of mine who could feel that he was scared, but also could feel his desire to go and, and to, to support his family, to be there at this important event. That was a good example of mixing emotions. And of course, the mixture of alarm and, and, and desire is courage. And what was fascinating actually is that he was able within a few weeks, literally less than a month later, attend a second funeral. And his ability to mix those emotions was really brought him to emotional maturity. His, his grandmother couldn't believe what he was able to do, but that mixing was so powerful. And then, of course, finally reflecting, being able to talk about and say, I, I, I get scared when I have to go to, lar to large groups, but I can handle it. And that re really brings us to what we hopefully call responsible sharing. What we want to make sure we understand is that emotions need to come out. Mature people are able to find the right time to bring that emotion out. So these first four steps are actually our relationship to the child's feelings, where we have to help them walk through these particular steps. And then bit by bit, they start to get a relationship to their own feelings, which brings them ultimately to the goal that we have, which is their relationships to other people in the context of their emotions. Now, as you may have guessed by seeing the way that this imagery is made, um, there really is a sequence to uh, emotional maturity. And so, um, you know, for us as adults, I think it's important to understand that we can't expect for the child to achieve reflection before we've even started by the beginning. Um, and, and of course, it, you know, accompanying a child who's in an emotional state, it can be quite debilitating at times, uh, you know, especially when it's our own child, but even working with a child whose emotions are very intense, when we want to accompany them, to comfort them, to guide them, 
it, it pushes our buttons too. And, and we too get sometimes sucked into that. Um, and, and thankfully, and this is why we're attaching today in this presentation, emotion and play, is that rather than working at, um, working at um, you know, inviting the emotion, it's more about trying to, to utilize play to, to help the child create those channels and to be able to, to release and express all of that emotion that's within them. So yes, emotion does indeed have serious work to do, um, and, and emotions uh, cannot mature by itself. It, 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 it requires a certain sequence. It requires a certain certain conditions, a certain environment. And thankfully, play is there to provide the safe context for that development to take place. And so we it it helps us to not have to work as hard, to pedal as hard, to to help them walk through that that sequence. And so when we're talking about play, not all play is equal. Um, we're talking about uh, what we name true play. And true play really is not so much anything that has to do with you know, a child playing video games or in front of a screen, or that is uh, you know, into a sport, uh, you know, competitive type of sport or playing a board game to win. It's not so much about the outcome. It really is more about the, the, the creative expression and so where the child feels safe to just kind of let it out where they're engaged into it this is something that they're not passive in front it's something that that is happening to them from within them and that they really have the freedom to to um to play it out however they uh want to and so th there's no in, there's no uh, repercussion in terms of the the real life um you know imaginary play is probably one of the best examples to illustrate true play but there's many different um you know different mediums in terms of true play and eva and i will walk those through with you so um of course when we're talking about the first step of expressing emotion uh, true play really is the best way to be able to walk that through and you can use play for you know a lot of these different steps um, but we're starting from the beginning and so expression, you know, being allowing to make space for the child to express is, you know, the first way through. Yes, as Dr. Neufeld says, the first law of emotion is that it must move. It mm -hmm. must move. And so this is the place where it can. And really, when we look at it, there is now a whole body of research dedicated, uh, researchers that are dedicated to understanding play. Uh, and also to, to understanding what happens when we lose the space to play. David Elkind in his book, The Power of Play, said that children have lost 12 hours of free time a week, including eight hours of unstructured play and outdoor activities. And we think, you know, I lived right next door to a school. These little guys were being walked to school by their parents at seven o'clock in the morning. Hopefully they had time to play at the daycare. Then they went to school. Then it was after daycare. They did their homework and the parents picked them up at six o'clock and then it was supper in bed and <laughs> or the weather other activities so uh, unfortunately this has happened that it's happened and, and Stuart Brown who was uh, part of a, a movement for the, this encyclopedia of play science says basically outdoor play has decreased by 71 percent in one generation in the US and the UK and of course we also know included in that is the amount of time that children are now playing uh, spending in front of screens What's really fascinating here is the work of Peter Gray, who noted that there's an, the escalating diagnoses of childhood anxiety, depression, and ADHD has paralleled the loss of play. So it's, it's not, I mean, we aren't able to make it causal at this point, but the, it's hugely powerful that we wonder why our children are having such a hard time well, it seems quite clear that if they don't have this opportunity to express emotions through this natural instinct that we have, and by the way, play is an instinct. They've actually, you know, are able to determine it's right next to the attachment instinct. It's right there. It's something that we are all moved to do, but we need the time to do it. I'm also just going to share with you um, Panksept's work because Panksept as well, uh, Dr. Neufeld was very disappointed because he really wanted to connect with, uh, with Dr. Panksept, but unfortunately he has since passed away. So Dr. Neufeld didn't have a chance to communicate with him, but his work is so important. But just one little piece I want to share here is that they basically he was looking at ADHD and the effect that it, that the psychostimulants that we give to children um, you know the Ritalin and so on actually what they noticed was that it reduces the natural play urges of human children 
Um, and the thing about it is, is so now we seem to have kind of a vicious circle because these children who should be playing more, um, you know, who should be playing actually have less play. And so it seems to kind of make their symptoms worse. Um, and so he, um, you know, is he basically said these children are now not able to benefit from something that should naturally be there for them. What's even more fascinating is he basically said to himself, hmm, I wonder if there's some way to do a workaround on this. And what he did, and again, there isn't like a whole lot of research on it because we can't really look inside of a child's brain as, as much as we'd like to, but he actually prescribed rough and tumble play. Um, and often fathers are more comfortable doing that. I'm sure a mother could do it just as well if she was given permission. But he, he prescribed rough and tumble play to the to the fathers of student children with ADHD and actually found that these activities help lessen some of the symptoms of, of the ADHD. So just something to think about. So what is play then? Well, where does play fit all into this? When they're stirred up, their play actually reflects the themes that they are struggling with. It's how children make sense of all the emotions they are experiencing. We have a little guy here. He's got his cape on. He's got his, 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 um, uh, his goggles on. You know, he's, a, he's facing the world. And let's face it, we have just come through two years of being, you know, under the, the scourge of this, um, of this virus that we can't even see. Well, children will play out whatever it is that's preoccupying them. Um, and this unstructured dramatic play gives children the freedom to choose their own roles, to do their own play scenarios. It allows them to just play that out things that are within them. And I know that kindergarten teachers have noticed the different kinds of plays, depending on what's going on. Um, you know, we just, it, there's just been this huge windstorm that caused, you know, power outages and trees to fall down. I'm sure the children were playing around that as well, because whatever it is that's preoccupying them is allowed to come through this dramatic play. And so talking about the benefits of play um, and emotion and how play really, you know, as I mentioned earlier, is, 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 it's risk-free. And so the child has a work-free space working at outcome, right? Not wanting, not having to please us, not having to go towards results and so forth. And so having the time and space in order to just play at whatever it is that needs to be worked through, uh, that it is a protection for feelings because when you are living emotions in real life, um, you know, and, and, you know, Eva had the imagery of the cookie cutter, there are, there can be repercussions where you're not feeling that certain emotions are invited or accepted. And so in play, it's not for real. You could be a character even and not be yourself. And, and so it's okay for that character to have certain feelings that you wouldn't allow yourself to have yourself um, and to not have the repercussions. So the expression without the repercussions. And so we'll go through different examples of where play can allow for emotion to express itself and to work itself through. And so pursuit, you know, pursuit is one of the instincts, one of the, the emotions that we don't talk a lot about because it is something that children don't often get themselves into trouble with at school. We see this more when pursuit has taken kind of, you know, another extreme. And sometimes, you know, um, in therapy, there, there will be some work through there. But at school, it's not often something we address. But I think I think it's important that we talk about this and that children do get opportunities to work through their pursuit. And so the, the little boy here on, on the picture is, an, is um, a boy who um, his mom had just given birth to a baby, a brother or sister, I can't recall which of the two. And unfortunately, it brought her into a postpartum depression. Uh, and um, the, this boy in the picture didn't have the opportunity to spend much time with mom because mom was caught up with, first of all, the baby, the new arrival of the baby, but also with herself and, and what was going through in her life. Um, and sadly, a little boy had to go back to daycare fairly quickly. Um, and so having, you know, this, this kind of stressful experience of having the arrival of a baby brother or sister and mom not being, you know, top shape and then being placed in daycare, uh, you know, soon after, um, he had a lot of, of pursuit that needed to be worked through, need, wanting to have mom there and trying to make sense of, of the baby brother and sister's birth. And so the picture that you see there is actually him replaying the, the birth, the arrival of the baby brother or sister. And, and, you know, perhaps adults sometimes get worried about seeing children who play in the loop with the same activities over and over and over again and feel that it may be obsessive. Uh, and we need to understand that 
play usually is actually a, you know a natural therapy for children that it allows for them to work through and to replay these things and and sometimes it can take many many times before they can are able to walk through the other side um and so here are other examples of pursuit type play so playing the orphan playing and replaying the birth of a sibling. So this is the picture that's here, pretending to be a creature, a dog or a cat to get affection. Um, my, uh, you know, we, we um, during COVID got a puppy and uh, my daughter noticed that, you know, the puppy's getting a lot of attention. And although she's 12, um, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll compare herself to the dog in order to get more of that, you know, that affection and, and, and attention. And, and so, you know, children will do this. Um, it, they're, they're quick and they're really smart and they, they pick up on things. Um, playing the baby or playing sick in order to solicit being taken care of. Uh, fairy tales also um, where children get lost, uh, you know, in separation. Disney movies are huge with this, um, where there's a loss of a parent and so forth. And so it's through the play that children get to imagine how they will survive in face of adversity. This, was, this comes from Hannah Beach, who's a terrific author and colleague of ours. And so the issue is not the play itself. It's not for us to be alarmed by the play that they're playing. Really, it allows for them to recognize, first of all, to work through the emotion, but also to recognize that they're okay on the other end, that they've survived it. And this gives them hope and strength and confidence. And so other types of pursuit play, and, and we don't often recognize this. And so I think it's, it's neat that we get to talk about this in this way, but that chasing games and hunting games and finding games are really helping children to, to work through their need for pursuit. And so tag, for example, um, or, or chasing to win the prize, um, you know, playing, um, you know, tr collecting different items where you're playing a hunting game, like the, what are those called? Like, like the treasure hunt type of games. And possessing oh, yeah. certain things, collecting, you know, like when we were little, you could collect cards of different kinds. Hiding, hide and go seek, that's a huge one. Um, and it's not the hide is fun, but it's being found that is the biggest piece. Uh, and the, the fantasies of, of, you know, finding love and, and being famous or having certain status and, and being praised for that. And so all of this helps us to work through our pursuit. And so alarm is another one um, in order to play through some of our fears, some of the alarming situations. Of course, COVID has been a big one. I know Hannah Beach did write an, an editorial on coronavirus tag and how for us not to be alarmed by that. Um, a colleague of mine, her daughters actually played um, treasure hunt with them. Um, they made, the, the, her two daughters made pictures of coronaviruses and they would hide them in the house and needed to find them and, and then hide them in a box. And so this was another way in order to address the fear of, of, of being, you know, in connection with COVID, but then, you know, being able to contain it. Um, playing with monsters, being a monster yourself and realizing that, you know, being the monster, it's not so bad, that there, maybe there's good sides to being a monster. Um, scary movies or scary stories where, you know, this is one step removed. Pretending to be scared. My daughter used to love playing floor as lava and to jump from one couch to the other where she wouldn't touch the ground to get, you know, her feet burned. Um, playing disasters. Um, you know, I'm sure after we had that ice storm back in the 90s that many children must have played over and over again all of this disaster of the ice storm. Uh, playing hospital or being sick. And this helps to reduce some of the of the, the drive of the alarm because it's not for real and we're able to exercise the the feeling of being afraid and having that flight um, type of reaction but it's in, in a safe place through play um, and so of course the flip side of alarm of fear is, is the courage and so for us to find our courage it's not that we're fearless it's not that we don't have fear but we're able to find through our fear um that that desire to to not lose out on whatever it is that we're missing out on because we're afraid to take the risk um, and so slaying the dragon type of play is for us to find our courage claiming the treasure play taming the monster daring ourselves in play um we had in one of our presentations earlier this year where we had tires or even in trees you know children playing to climb the tree or to climb the tires and to take that risk and to be able to do that in play it's much easier than to do into real life yes and i think children often um, will will challenge themselves with just the right amount right yes just the right amount of risk you know the little one who jumps off one stair versus the one who jumps off two stairs or you know leaps one way so they, they it's about calibrating that alarm system through the play mode when it doesn't matter 
but when you can just do it. Yeah. And yeah. it's a good point that you bring up, Eva. So yes, it's about the release of the emotion, but the fact that that we're, the play can also help to calibrate, uh, you know, the amygdala and, and the the limbic system is it's a, it's a it's a double benefit in terms of the play with the alarm. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, um, for those who who may not be familiar with Gordon Neufeld's imagery on the traffic circle, um, I'll, I'll just walk you through really quickly. Um, you know, thinking about frustration and how you know frustration when it gets the best of us, we move to attack. And so, whether it's through words, foul words, or it could be through action, whether you know it's kicking, hitting, or, or whatnot, um, the 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 you know, before the child gets to attack, if there isn't a change that can be made and that the child is not in a place that they can adapt and accept whatever it is that's frustrating them, they're not moving to tears, the piece that we can help them with before they get to the attack is actually the emotional release. And play is the best medium to allow for that, both in prevention and in intervention. Sometimes being playful as an adult and for us not to react so strongly helps to defuse a very frustrating type of situation. And so here are examples of types of play to address uh, frustration. And please understand that frustration, like alarm, has two sides to it. And so there's the portion about wanting to make things work. And of course, we can't always affect change. I mean, sometimes like that example of the boy who got a baby brother or sister and, you know, uh, had to go right to daycare, he could change that. He couldn't change the fact that, the, you know, the brother or sister was born and that mom was going through a hard time. Um, and so sometimes, you know, a type of play besides pursuit or alarm could be to try to make other things work in your life. And that can compensate for these other portions in our life that don't work. Uh, puzzles are a wonderful way in order to make things work, to try to put the pieces together at uh, building games, uh, whether it's construction or through craft or with Legos and blocks. Um, and, 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 you know, all of that really helps to try to make things work. Um, stories could be another way. I know Eva's going to speak about that a bit later. Um, but stories to hear characters that have, have things that have worked through can help also to, to experience that through the character. Yeah, I have to admit this was uh, kind of eye-opening for me because I've, obviously we know that block play and all that construction play is fantastic for the development of the brain but it actually so soothes an emotional part of us as well mm. you know and I think it's important that we recognize that it, it can it, play has multi-facets oh yeah. absolutely um, and patience is, a, is another fruit, uh, you know, of uh, if we're able to to practice enough and through play, um, you know, finding our patience that we're hoping that as the child gets older and has enough prefrontal cortex to have the two sides, patience really is the fruit of, yes, being frustrated, but also caring enough about the person or the situation that we're able to um, find the desire to tame that frustration and to find our patience. Um, and so this is where it's so important for us as adults when we're playing with, you know, uh, um, with our children, board games, for example, but they're also playing through like, you know, here they're ha they have different blocks that sometimes things don't work their way. Sometimes they're not going to win that, that, um, that board game that we're playing. And I think it's important that they don't always win. We need for them to live, um, you know, uh, roadblocks in life to be able to face those frustrations frustrations and to find their their patience through that um, and so to, to master that um, and, and then of course um, playing out the the impulse to attack um, this is one that adults I think have a hard time with especially in schools um, we, we've been told time and time again that rough play does not have its place in schools and yet um, we have some some research we've got actual schools in Quebec that have uh, decided to actively allow for children to rough play and, and to see what you know what would that give on the mid long term and, and they've seen huge benefits to allow for rough play please know that um, uh, myself and my other colleague Martin through the uh, at some point during the year and you'll see at the end of this presentation we've got a resource list we have a presentation that we do talk a bit more about rough play and how how you can put the parameters around that and the benefits of it um, and so here we're really just introducing it but any play around destroying and demolishing whether it's you know putting together uh, cardboard boxes and then just knocking them over or a tower of blocks and knocking that over and um, hitting and throwing kicking screaming war games, attacking games, play fighting games. Um, and please understand that there's a difference between, um, you know, um, there is there is some parameters around that. It's not about just letting them go free play and that, um, that there isn't, you know, some sort of, of supervision or some sort of structure around that. 
Um, and so this helps to reduce frustration on a preventative level. Uh, mm -hmm. And also when the child is over the top frustrated to kind of let out the over the top emotion and then to be able to bring it down to a more, a place where they're able to kind of um, work through. Because the thing that we need to understand is that, and, and I think it's the same thing for us as adults, when it's too <laughs> intense, it's like we're there, but we're not there. We're all into our emotions and we're, we're kind of taken, we're, we, you know, we're taken, the, our best is taken by it. But if we can reduce a bit of that intensity, then we're in a place where we're able to access more our prefrontal cortex and to have that the, the 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 reflection of the two right that yes I'm I'm upset by this but then mm -hmm. you know I, I care about this other person and I don't want to hurt them yeah. uh, and so we can't be too upset to have that that um, reflection yeah and that's that's where I think when we go back to the stair steps where we get mm. to the responsible sharing because all of us have figured out who we can you know I mean we all have the desire to attack. We get frustrated with our colleagues. We get frustrated with our children. We get frustrated with our spouse. You know, I have yeah. some dear friends who know that I love my husband dearly, but sometimes he drives me crazy. And so I sometimes say, listen, just, just, I just need to, to vent right now. And that's the responsible sharing. So we do it verbally. Yes. Um, I know there have been times in my life when I have gone down into the parking lot and slammed my car door, <laughs> letting it out. And of course, we see this with our children what happens at recess time the doors burst open and they start running and they start shouting and they just let it out and and again this is in the play mode it's responsible I mean it, venting isn't necessarily in the play mode but but it but it, it's it's this responsible sharing but if we can leave a little bit of space for this uh, which we do we do let kids kick balls around we do you know we do let them do some of the things in the playground but just not to be so frightened of it because it's it's when we understand emotional development um we we know that within the play mode it truly is play and lots of time kids know when to stop there's a whole nother discussion we can have around that we might have time at the end so the other thing which of course comes into play is futility and sadness so futility as Catherine mentioned not winning all the time not getting it right all the time but it's okay because in games it doesn't count and again is one of the challenges we often have to deal with as adults is is uh, what happens when a child loses but if we let them feel their sadness about it they will eventually come to terms with the fact that they can't always make things work they can't always make other people do what they have to do um, and then of course in in stories uh, there's this one step removed where there's all sorts of things that you know that the hero couldn't control and people start they start to realize that and it really moves children into the area of resilience sadness is another huge one and we've any of you listen to our presentations we just want to always talk about tears and sadness well the beauty of it is in play and look at these girls here they're watching a movie right and probably if they had been sitting and talking to each other and even if they've been talking about something sad they probably would have felt embarrassed about their tears but they're watching a movie and so it's okay for the tears to come you know and so it's something that we could cry about that's one step removed Honestly, probably every, these girls are not really crying about what's going on in the movie. They're accessing the tears that are within them, you know, and it takes the defenses down. We're, we're looking at the, at the screen so we don't have to look at each other. Now I don't need to feel so vulnerable. And there's no self-consciousness, shame or fear around the tears. It's okay to cry at sad movies, at least clearly in this, these girls' world. It's okay for the child who is playing, you know, who's, who's, who's playing, um, you know, that, that they're, that their orphan that their mummy that you know that their mummy has died and they're crying because they're you know their mummy has died these are things that 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 they can they can cry about because it's not real life and it promotes adaptation and it builds that resilience so exactly that you kind of put on a mask you put on a, you know, a cape you put on something to cover yourself you put on a pair of glasses all of these things make you feel safer which you can do through play and therefore you can feel that vulnerability of your emotions puppets are another wonderful way um, i remember again um, someone was saying to me oh the minute i start talking to this child about being sad or about being frustrated or about anything about being alarmed they just shut right down but 
they bring out the puppets and now they can start talking about this and that, da, 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 and whatever is happening. And so it really is a way one step removed of dealing with emotions that are just too hard to talk about. So we need to give lots and lots and lots of space to this. Um, we had uh, some resources shared with us by Lester B. Pearson um, and one of the women's from University of, um, of, of Montreal uh, said basically, uh, based on the research that she was looking at, that you need to let children do this kind of expressive play for anywhere from up to 40 minutes before it can manifest itself out, can work its way through. Uh, and I know that in our K4 program, uh, a K5 program, where you're asked to give at least 45 minutes to play. Um, because without that time, the child can't develop these, these themes and work through these themes. There are other ways, of course, because when we talk about play, it's kind of a broader thing than, than just the, the individual or the expressive play that children do either by themselves or in a group. Stories are part of play, like reading stories, writing stories. This is for older children, telling stories. You know what I would love is to have some of our grade fours and grade fives go and tell stories to the kindergarten children. And, you can and they would tell stories with all sorts of emotion in them. And that would meet their emotional needs, but also help the children who are listening, hearing the stories, watching the movies, which are actually stories, creating stories, acting out stories, um, all different ways of activating emotions. And, and even with our teenagers, you know, I would love for our, you know, if we could get our teenagers, again, unfortunately, our elementary and high schools are separated, but, you know, get them to make Make a play that they want to tell the kindergarten children oh I'm sure all sorts of things would come out that they would never talk about to an adult but they would want to share with children that might be something we could look at you know we can touch on dynamics and topics that could be just too overwhelming in real life but allow to us allows it to come out with our teens we call these emotional playgrounds drama poetry music drawing painting, dance, all ways in which these kinds of emotions can come out. Ultimately, we need to believe in the healing power of play. Play can soften our defenses and especially with the tears to help the tears come out. It provides safety from the repercussions of emotional expression. It's okay to let that emotion out. And we need to give space for even some of the things that we're a little bit worried about, like the attacking energy. It creates that movement that's essential for healing and recovery. Remember, the body has to do something with all that adrenaline, that cortisol, that norepinephrine. It's got to move its way through. Um, and not only physiologically, but also emotionally. It's kind of a, we're a whole system. We're not just our body and, and our brain, but it all has to most move through. And when the amygdala and the, and the hypothalamus says, oh, okay, that adrenaline is going down. Things must be happening. We're resolving that problem. The brain then can access the other parts, which are the more thinking parts. This spontaneous replay, you know, it allows for the discharge. And by the way, when we talk about replay, by the way, we all do this. If you've had something particularly different, difficult happen in your life, you've probably found yourself telling your friends over and over and over again about what happened, about what happened. And of course, your best friends are the ones that invite that replay. I'm so sorry to hear about, you know, the loss that happened in your family, tell me what happened. And then you give the person the space to say it. And some of us say, oh my goodness, I feel so embarrassed because I've said this so many times. Well, until your brain has kind of been able to work it through, you need that opportunity. And of course, that's what therapists do, right, Catherine? You listen to the replay. Exactly. And ch children, of course, can do that through their actual play. Ultimately, we need to make time for this. And we need to remember that children also sometimes need to play alone. Uh, because when they're playing alone, they are now creating their own identity. And they're working through their emotions. And maybe some of the other children don't have that emotion, that little boy who had to play through with his brother, they the other children weren't interested in that. But that was fascinating to him. He needed to do that alone. But they also do it with each other. And as part of getting along in the socialization, 
that we want our children to do. And they encourage each other. I remember a whole kindergarten that played tornado right? when there had been the tornado in Gatineau. So they play with each other and they, and they, because they're experiencing similar emotions. And then when we, as the adults play with children, first of all, it increases attachment because nods and smiles and all this wonderful space that we're giving to children through the play. And also we can actually help them work through their emotions. Sometimes we need to do the sword fighting with them with the pool noodles because we know they need to get it out but we make it fun um, and and if they want to engage in it we allow them to engage in it if they don't we find something else hmm. as dr newfeld tells us emotion is nature's way of taking care of us and play is nature's way of taking care of emotion well put so just to remind you, we have a whole section on our website about emotion and play. And Catherine will be uploading um, a few more uh, items there as well. Yes. Um, and we also have another resource list of other uh, materials that are not yet on our website, but that you can access through the internet. And then on our member site as well, I, I know that there's more things about play there uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. So do we want to go to our questions here? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I actually just realized, Eva, that uh, one of the questions we, we already answered through your, your second to last slide. Um, so maybe we can start by the beginning and, and, and go from there. Um, so how can teachers in school make space for more playtime is the first question. Eva, I'll let you start. Well, well, I mean, the bottom line is there's only so many hours in the day. The more that I now have recognized the importance of play, both for the neurological development and for the emotional well-being, we have to start saying this is a priority. Yes. And if any of you have heard our presentations that we gave all the way through the pandemic, it was all about making space for emotions in a playful way. Uh, so we need to make we need to basically reassure ourselves that it's not just downtime; it's actually very important time. And, and not just for for K four K five, of course. Ideally, for for all students. Yeah, you know, in, in yeah. one shape or form. And the, the irony of it is the more child is experiencing emotional distress, the more time they need for play. But usually their behavior gets in the way and they get they get dinged the play time. Right, for sure. Uh, this is a question I often get both uh, working in schools and actually my private practice when I'm working with parents. Um, do adults need to get involved for the play to be beneficial? Uh, and and the answer is no. There there isn't. A, a, I mean, it's no. It's no and yes. It, it's no in the sense that um, yes, adults can play with children. I mean, I think Eva gave some some good examples. But I think that we need to be careful that we don't think it's our responsibility to um, work the play through with the child to orchestrate it. Like some people even get into play therapy to thinking that they, this is what's going to help the child work through their emotions. We need to understand that play is therapeutic on its own. And so it's not about necessarily getting into it with the child. It's really about providing the time, the space, and, and that there isn't kind of pressures there for the child to perform, to want to please, to have screens that are distracting or whatnot. And so if we can provide for that space, that time and, and material, that this is more than what they need in order to get themselves into play and that the benefits are, is the play itself that's beneficial. Exactly, exactly. Um, and so another question that we often get is what types of play should we be encouraging? Uh, are games on the smart board, for example, considered as true play? So Eva? Oh, no. <laughs> Again, screens for the most part uh, really should not even, ex should not be available at all in our K4 and K5. Uh, kids get enough of it outside of that. Um, what we really want to be fostering is something coming from inside. Uh, there's two factors. Uh, one is, of course, some children will initially complain about being bored and we need to leave space for boredom. They can't fill that space if they, mm -hmm. there isn't, isn't something to fill, a space to fill. And uh, and some of our children are not used to. They have to feel their sadness about not getting that uh, you know device given to them um, and maybe even some of their frustration. Uh, but if we persist long enough, uh, they will they will get there. And that is when the true play happens. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this is the question that Eva actually answered two slides ago. And so do we need to encourage children to play together or, or is a play equally beneficial when children play alone? And so I think it's important for, for all to, both of them to be. Um... And actually, interestingly enough, something that comes up and it, it comes around this because it's uh, again, I would love, by the way, if I could find a way to be a fly on a wall in mm -hmm. a kindergarten, because I would love to watch 
a couple of things happen. One thing that I would love to watch happen is how emotional play then turns into emergent play. Because first you have to deal with your emotions before you can mm. then start to do that kind of really truly creative, uh, you know, sort of next level of play. So I'd love to see how that happens. Um, and so that would be one thing to watch. But the other piece to watch is that actually children who are emergent, who really should have a quite a big desire to play by themselves. Because really, if I have to keep trying to adjust, especially as a four-year-old, to somebody else's idea of what I should right. be playing with, I want to be, I want to play mountain climber and you want to play firefighter. <laughs> you know, we're not on the same. And, and yet I want to be able to play mountain climber, right? Because yes. that's important to me. And so if I have to, so actually we need to be seeing healthy children have a desire to play by themselves. Mm. I'm going to flip that on its head and just give you an example of uh, a group of children. They were in a program we called NEST. They had a lot of behavior problems, consequently a lot of emotional problems. And we wanted them to have time to play alone. We created a lot of time for place space for play. We knew it was the antidote or the, 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 uh, to, 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 to the behavior problems. But there were a couple of kids that couldn't play alone. Mm. And the teacher basically said, I don't know what to do, because actually, they were feeling so vulnerable, they didn't even want to feel their emotions. So they wanted to play somebody else's game, so to speak, like get their mind, they were using play as distraction. Mm. A few months later, I came back and the teacher said, mm, I think we're going to have a difficulty today because his play partner isn't here. I said, Okay, I understand he'll probably be frustrated and things might not, not work. Thank you very much for warning me. That's okay. Well, playtime came and whatever happened, the spaces were allocated and this little guy found himself alone. What was fascinating to me was first he looked around and realized his friend wasn't there. And then instead of trying to join other kids, he started to play by himself. He took the little creatures from the farm and he did this and did that. And the teacher just looked at me and I, I was so proud of that program. I said to her afterwards, look at how safe you have made him mm. feel. He now can play, fill right. his world by himself. He didn't have to distract himself. So actually, I think the desire to play alone is a sign of emotional health. Mm. And it's so counterintuitive, I feel, to our culture because, I mean, I even have a mom that I was working with in private practice that, and she has an only child and her child was young. I think she was four when we started working together and, and, and the insistence of having play dates and, and socializing her child and that she needed friends and that, you know, would she be normal if she didn't? And, and, and there's such a pressure, I feel, you know, from, from today's culture, it's, it's such a like, you know, ha having friends and, and, and being with friends is, is what's normal, but we need to understand that what's normal doesn't mean that that's what's needed and natural, right? <laughs> normal is not, the normal is the norm, which society yes. thinks natural um, is, is not necessarily the norm. And, and actually, uh, as I say to me, exactly. a child who can fill their own time and space is a child and again we we go back to the brain development the capacity to cooperate with other people doesn't really happen until you're seven years old so anyway there's a long we talk <laughs> about this in various places but um i uh, i i i i would stand by the fact that playing being able to keep yourself occupied alone is a, a big thing mm. Now, um, we talked about the rough play a little bit. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I, and and sh should we allow it and to what extent? And, and it, it is a difficult question to answer in the sense of the extent. I do believe that we should allow it. Now, I do understand that there's pressures both from the school and from parents from from the community about not allowing it. But there's ways that we can go about it, um, you know, um, that, that, can, that can be progressive and that can help kind of script and to walk the child through um, and to really support them. And, and that um, it doesn't there's been there's been you know, proof that has shown and I actually worked with a school that they do allow rough play um, in the eastern townships. And they've told me that since they've put the rough play in place, there has not been children who have been more physically wounded, hurt yeah. by, by the rough play itself. And so, and that's one of the biggest fears that we have, that if we allow this, then it's going to go over the top and then somebody's going to get hurt. And, and no, I don't think that's true. Well, um, as my son's yeah. friend said, Eva, this is how boys play. <laughs> I, I, like my, I like your son. I don't want to hurt him. If I hurt him, it's by accident. 
Right. And that's how we need to treat it as well. I, yes. Again, I'm thinking more of the New Zealand example where they let the children play like with with all sorts of things like it was really a wild uh, playground that they allowed the kids to play in um, and they didn't have more accidents mm. because the kids monitored themselves but I truly believe that if there was a, if there was an accident rather than doing which we tend to do moralizing and saying well I told you you shouldn't do that right. oh I'm so sorry you got hurt Mm. kids don't want to get hurt they don't want to hurt other people anyway long 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 story around that <laughs> I just want to say one more little little anecdote which is that um, I had a school of the St. Raphael school in Montreal maybe I shouldn't be this <laughs> anyway St. Raphael understood this and they uh, they said that they tolerated a little bit more rough and tumble play than they would have normally they kept an eye out on it they knew which of their kids were likely to get in trouble which ones they had to intervene with and again same thing they said, oh, it didn't deteriorate. Mm. It really didn't. Last question. And so must I step in and comfort a child if they display sadness or anger during their play or do I step back and, and let it run its course? And I would say, depending on the situation, it could be a, a, you know, a bit of one or the other. Um, I think that if the child is turning towards us and, and that we have cues that, that, they, that uh, you know, there, there's a, a want, a desire there for us to come in and to comfort them, absolutely, I think that, that you know, it, it's, it's all right and we should do so. Um, but there are times when the child is really focused very deeply into their play and that they're really into a character that that no if we step in we actually might distract them from their play and it's okay to take us take a step back and just let play do its thing and that play is able to help that child accompany them and whatever it is that they need um and so this is where you know we kind of need to walk with that we need to dance that dance that we need to see you know when are the times to step in and when it's a time to step back and sometimes you know we'll realize oh, okay maybe i shouldn't have stepped in and, and you know you adjust but um, yeah, there isn't one specific way in this. There's no recipe with this. No, 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 for sure. Mm. Well, these were the questions that had come up at another session that we did. And I don't mm -hmm. know if people have some questions, um, but just want to remind you again that uh, we have one more. <laughs> oh, I forgot to put the date in. What's the, it's the 14th. Oh, it's uh, June uh, 16th. June 16th. Yes, yes. I was going to make yeah. sure to. Yeah, so yeah. June 16th. Um, and so you're welcome to join us then. Um, and also, um, we have uh, the feedback form, which got in the email that I sent you. So if you can just uh, give that, fill that in, um, either at the end of today, or if you are watching this on our recording. For so sure. I will stop sharing. And Catherine, we just need to go and see if we have some questions. Wonderful. And I wanted to say for those who are watching this as a recording, uh, the, the, to fill out the survey or to get the handout or to watch the recording, uh, although you'd be what you'd have found the <laughs> recording if you're watching this, but that you that all of this will be on on her homepage uh, and in other places on our website. So I know that Edith, Edith was saying that at GPI, they do have plays that they're putting together. And so I don't know, what, Edith, if this is what a play that you you guys put together this year, the, the, the little Marmé. I don't know if Edith is still here. She is. Yes, and so she was giving an example because you were talking about plays, Eva, how it'd be great at oh. the high school level to uh, to have yeah. plays, yeah. I know. Oh, I mean, I think I think that would be an amazing thing to, uh, you know, for high schools to prepare. And, you know, and, and again, if you think about how you protect vulnerability, they'll do stuff for the kindergarten children that they wouldn't talk about among themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Good. Well, well I, I don't see yeah. any other questions or comments, so I guess we answered them through, through <laughs> our, the, com the common <laughs> questions. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we thank everyone for, thank for being you. here today and uh, look forward to getting your feedback about the session. Absolutely. I will stop the recording. <laughs>